Welcome to Cure America. I'm Star Parker. Well, last time we talked about these falling birthing rates, uh, it was the Census Bureau that said, hey, we should be concerned. Now the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention report that births in the USA reached another historic low in 2020. For the sixth consecutive year, the birth rate dropped, this time by 4%. The rate at which American women are now having babies is way below the rate necessary to keep the population at a steady state, to not shrink. A steady state requires a total fertility rate of 2.1 babies per woman. In 2020, the birth rate was 1.64. Many say the reason for the low birth rate is that young women, young people, are marrying less and having less kids because they don't feel confident about their job prospects and financial security. Yeah, people are still writing that. It's constant, that narrative from the left. Oh, no, no, this is because of money. This is because of security. Is that really it? A job and financial security? Or is there another reason Americans aren't having children? Well, according to the Institute for Family Studies, in 2018, 35% of Americans aged 25 to 50 had never been married. In 1970, only 9% in this age range had never been married. Why aren't people getting married and having families? Well, a Pew Research survey conducted last year found that 16% of men said having children is essential to a fulfilling life, and 16% said the same of marriage. Yep, that's it, 16%. Yet 57% of men said having a job or career they enjoy is essential for him to be fulfilled in life. Yeah, I'd expect that for men. Yeah, work, women get you married to them, and then they can spend all the money. But it's troubling, this survey, because it showed that only 22% of women said having children is essential for a fulfilling life. And only 17% said marriage is essential for a fulfilling life. Did you hear that? 17% of women said marriage is essential? What happened to that Cinderella dream, getting married to Prince Charming, living happily ever after, having grandkids for your mom? 46% of women said having a job or career they enjoy is most important to their lives. So what does this mean? Well, it means that the attitudes of American young people are the reason for the low birth rates. I'm sorry, everybody on the progressive left and all of you now Republican senators that want to pretend that we can change this dynamic by pouring more government money there, but that's the real problem. You know, it's interesting, the economic consequences, though, of these low birth rates, they're dire. And I'm hoping that people, while they're considering, well, more big government, that they keep in mind that a gray in population due to fewer and fewer children means a shrinking portion of the population that is working and producing, and increasingly large numbers of elderly and retirement people, <laughs> those that are already retired, hey, we're being asked to support them. We have Medicare, we have Social Security. That means more people are taken out of these systems than are putting in. And that might not be good news for all of those young people that think, well, I don't wanna be married. Well, I don't wanna have kids. Well, there are some policy prescriptions from Washington. They wanna go this route. President Joe Biden proposes spending 1.8 trillion to booster families. Senator Romney, oh gosh, he's proposing payments from the government up to encourage more children. I mean, he wants to give it like $1,500 a month, I think I heard some of his proposals. This is gonna be interesting up against what we're already doing in the welfare state. Cause you gotta wonder, is government the solution to the family problem? And people not wanting to have children. We're gonna have to talk to some experts. Last time we approached this subject, I had guys on and they were like, a little bit wondering, but this time I'm gonna have some policy experts that are female. One is Dr. Catherine Pakaluk. She's an assistant professor of social research and economic thought at the Catholic University of America here in Washington, D.C. Her primary areas of research include economics of education and religion, family studies, and demography. Dr. Pakaluk has an extensive and impressive resume, including receiving her doctorate from Harvard University, and most impressive is that she has eight children. So you can't blame this birth rate uh, decline on her. But what about the rest of the women in the country? We're going to talk to our in-house pastor, Reverend Tim Lateef, 
who will give us some spiritual perspective of how we look at marriage and family and what we can do to turn our country around. Pastor Tim heads our clergy center here at the, uh, at the uh, Center for Urban Renewal and Education, and he always brings a scripture right when I need it, right when I need it, because we have to cut through the noise of the news to get to some truth, to find the real solutions about the low birth rates with our panel. And our panel usually throws a whole lot of stuff out there that I need a pastor to talk to uh, in between before we get to solutions. So let's get to it. Let's get to this very, very important discussion again about this birth death. We'll do that right after this message. Let's take a quick history lesson. Just two centuries ago, 94% of the people in the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, it's eight and a half percent. In a century, our life expectancies more than doubled. How did we come so far so fast? The freedom to create, to start a business, to keep what you earn. Don't let the socialists and radical left cost us our progress, our freedom, and our well being. It's time we fight for America and vote for America. It's time for a cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, D.C., Cure works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. Cure's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo Christian perspective. Cure, join with us. There has never been a better time to help black communities. interview today. I told you about her in my opening, uh, Dr. Catherine Pakaluk. I keep calling her that. I know that that's not really how to pronounce okay. your last name. That's all right. It's Pakaluk. Pakaluk, mm -hmm. because it's Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Oh, Ukrainian. nice, nice, yep. nice. We always try to make anyone's yeah. name come to us. <laughs> but they try to do that, too, when we leave the country. It's like, that's really your name, Star? Yeah. Well, thank you for joining me. Absolutely. Um, you're the associate, um, your assistant professor of social research and economic thought at mm -hmm. the Catholic University of America here in Washington, D.C. Yeah. You're yeah. writing a book. Yeah. You're actually going around asking women, mm -hmm. why are you having these children? You have eight of them yourself. I do, I do. And, and, and we are concerned. Concerned. I mean, the yeah. birth rates are falling. Something's yeah. happening in culture. Yep. We can assume. I mean, all the yep. headlines are saying, no, no, it's just women wanting to yeah. not have children and yep. not have marriage. Yep. But something's broken down. So yep. thank you for joining me. And Absolutely. please, you, you sure. are the expert in this sure. area. Yeah. Long research, long thought, long yeah. writing. Well, so tell us this is such an on. interesting question, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, something that people, um, especially these days, tend not to think about, we are so short-sighted. This trend of, of having fewer children has gone on for quite some time. I mean, a couple of hundred years in this country. Okay. Um, around 1800, we were looking at about seven or eight children per woman. And in 1900, four children per woman. And then by 2000, about two. And now we know that we're plummeting below two, right? Um, so that's a 200 year trend, right? So this isn't about last year. It isn't about the pandemic. It's, um, it's a longer trend. It's just that these numbers we're seeing recently are um, really devastating, right? right? They're right. very devastating both to communities and to families, um, but also to our country. Well now, okay, this we have to go back then because some on we the do. left will argue to say, mm -hmm. well, that's because women were forced to have those children. Mm -hmm. They were forced into marriage. They didn't yeah. have the freedoms that we have today. Yeah. And therefore, this is what women really want. Is this mm -hmm. what really women want, is yeah. to not be married, to age yeah. and die alone and not yeah. leave uh, grandchildren for yeah. their, their family? No, I don't think so. I mean, all of the major social surveys, uh, we, I mean, we certainly don't see women saying that they want to have eight on average. They don't want to do what I did. <laughs> You know, I'm glad I had the freedom to do what I did. I, I wouldn't take a single one of my children back. Um, but women aren't saying they want to have eight anymore. But we do see um, a really persistent and disturbing fact, which is that women say that they would like to have, on average, one or two children more than they end up having. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in an age when we worry a lot about women's rights and women's preferences and um, respecting women's um, control over their lives, we're not that curious about that one. And I would, I think that we should be, and I'm wondering yeah. how much the yeah. the culture, that that pressure of the mm -hmm. culture that says you own the only think career, that deep down inside they want that Cinderella yeah. dream, that I do yeah. prefer that yeah. one or two children, uh, yeah. and then they don't realize that, and they don't yeah. realize marriage, so then they tell the poster, yeah. oh, I didn't want those things in the first place. No, that's right. It's become a little bit of a maybe an embarrassing thing to say mm -hmm. when you're 16. You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to get married and have kids. I mean, yeah. I have.
have a couple of girls that say that in my house. Oh, good for you. Um, you my know. granddaughter actually said it. When she was in the uh, first grade, I was sitting there and I said, Jesus yeah. was on the wall. She was yeah. in Catholic school. I said, yeah. oh, uh, Jesus loves you. He's your best friend. And she said, um, no, my best friend is, and she named her best yeah. friend. And I said, okay, let me change the subject really quickly. What do you want to be when you grow up? And she said, a mom, of course. <laughs> yep. So you're right. Yep. The, the inside, yep. there's just something that says, it's yeah. a part of who I am, and we're reminded yeah. every 30 days. So I'm wondering yeah. what that's right. What role contraceptives, abortion? Mm -hmm. I mean, is this yeah. changing the culture? Too? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think so. One of the one of the early pieces of research I did in my life was to look and see what role the the pill had in in affecting. Um, women's trajectories. And what we saw is that it allowed elite women, women whose fathers had gotten a college education to get more education. But we saw that that uh, did not really play out for women um, who's, who were less advantaged, women whose fathers had not graduated college. Um, in, fa in fact, what we saw for those women was that um, they became more likely to end up unmarried with their first child. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a devastating fact, right? That um, we called this a paradox that um, that the pill and abortion have, um, in some sense, worked for a certain upper echelon, a certain intellectual elite in this country. Um, and they have not worked for women who wanted to have, uh, wanted to get married, uh, wanted to have their children in marriage. Um, it's become harder to find uh, a good, a good husband and a good provider, um, especially at the time when your body is telling you you're ready to have children. Right. Um, so we still see that women um, who are are baby oriented, who 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 love to have children, who want to have a child, they think it's a kind of a normal, natural thing to do in your 20s. Um, and they're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they, those women are finding it much harder to find uh, a marriage partner in their 20s. Well, they are. And that might have something yeah. to do with the expectations. Yeah. So, because once women say, I'm looking for, and they have yeah. all this long list yeah. to fulfill, uh, and, men are going to say, well, I yeah. don't have those. And we've made marriage things, very expensive. But, yeah, and, and materialism is, is plays a role, exactly. Yeah. And so those are the things that I want to yeah. talk to my panel right. About is the role of government. Yeah. But I want to know from you, yeah. uh, Doctor, is your your book? Yeah. You're looking at yeah. and asking women who yeah. are having bigger families. Mm -hmm. what, what are you finding so yeah. far? Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so I went out and I said, look, you know, in, when you see a trend, you can ask people who are engaged in that trend why, and you can try to find out from the people who are not in that trend, the outliers, why not? <laughs> why are you not doing the same thing as those? And that was the inspiration to go out and talk to women. So we really just sought out a group of women with um, bigger families. And we tried to find um, a variety of you know, religious and ethnic backgrounds. And we did find a variety of religious backgrounds. We did not find any non-religious. Um, and that was very interesting. We tried very hard okay, to okay. find women with five or six children who are not, not religious. In when it's religious, you mean they're Catholic, they're Mormon, Mormon they're Jewish, Jewish um, evangelical, variety. They're willing to yes. traditional and, and, life patterns. And when I went and talked to these women, um, that is exactly what we found. We heard story after story of connection to churches to um, conversion stories, um, a very memorable story of a Jewish woman who, you know, was on a beach in Hawaii doing meditation at some point as a young woman, and tried to figure what's the purpose of my life, and then you know went to went to Israel, had a conversion, um, discovered no, this is the purpose of my life as a Jewish woman, mm -hmm. um, found a Jewish husband, and you know they have a, seven babies, you know, oh, um, and she said, but I realized this is the answer when I was you know 21 and I wanted to connect with infinity. This is how you connect with infinity. That's exactly right. You have yeah. children. You have children, and I think that that discussion has to take yeah. place more uh, in our culture. Yeah. We're seeing now bigger emphasis on role of government. They're mm -hmm. pretending that the reason children are not uh, being produced mm -hmm. and marriage is not occurring is because of something we haven't mm -hmm. done as a society. Yeah. Are you believing that, or is yeah. it something that I am not we're believing missing? that? I mean, what I would say is that um, again, looking back, uh, this is not you know the first time we've been worried, or certain countries have been worried about birth dearth, if you will. Um, it's easy for government programs and government interventions to discourage births, right? Well, Certain kinds of happened. taxations, sure. making it harder to get married, um, making things more expensive. Um, we can talk about education, for instance. Um, but it's very hard for the government or any kind of government programs to encourage birth, right? So it's easier to break down families and institutions than it is to build them up with a government program. And I think that's what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. That you know, there, there are probably many things we could point to in the role of government that has been unjust right. to families, to churches, and to local communities. Right. But I do not see a path forward to building these things up with the arm of the government. Right. I don't see that either. But what I do see is that the need to mm -hmm. get the church back involved in yes. community, to yes. start speaking, in particular, you said about that poor woman yes. who 
we no wants children because they're having children, yeah, exactly. and they might want children, uh, but yeah. don't have them because now yeah. we're seeing abortion. Yeah. Is in an abortion mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we can do to make sure that Absolutely. women get back into Absolutely. a desire to fulfill? Absolutely. Um, you will not. You will not meet a woman who was 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 helped to avoid that that abortion that regrets it later, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, you find quite the opposite. You know, this is the thing that saved my life. Um, so yeah, I think legal abortion has to be pushed back, yeah, you know, yeah. absolutely, as, to the extent that we can in our current, you know, regulatory environment. It's been disappointing, of course, for pro-life persons to, yes. to make progress. I think that would help a great deal. Um, and not necessarily for each individual person. I mean, everyone has a story. But the culture, broadly, that we start to understand better that um, the things which seem like burdens are very often the things which help us to know who we are, yeah. you know? Yeah. And you know, when you I see your that's kids, that's something you, that the poor know that they the do. elite don't. They do. Because it you is see so them true. have that child even though it it's is, a struggle. It is so and true. And they're gonna work it out. Yeah, uh, and, and so, I talk to women on food stamps yeah. Who, yeah. who were in my sample. You know, and you know, not a single one said, you know, I'm having all these kids because it's the right financial decision for me, <laughs> right? But it's like we can make decisions, we can make trade-offs. Yeah, uh, yeah. But you are quite right about that—that um, yeah. that the value of sacrifice and and hard work, and what gives you um, confidence that you can do that. Yeah. Well, traditionally, that is what religion serves in our lives. That's you right. wake up in the morning, I can, I. I got this because God's this, got me. God got me. Oh right. my goodness! Thank yeah. you so much. Dr. You're so welcome. Thanks for reminding us yeah. of those principles. Yeah. I'm going to come back with my panel. I think that they're uh, going to give us a little more insight yeah. of what government looks like and yeah. what it's been doing. You're but so you have It's been a pleasure. You've certainly yeah. focused us on the right thing and the right attitude about them. Um, you. you can be fulfilled as a woman yeah. with marriage and yes, with children, yeah. and whether you're rich or poor. So appreciate yeah. that. Welcome. Yeah, I'll be right back. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Uh, we've got a new year in front of us, 2021, and, and new opportunities. But for many, we've got the same old problem. There's that emptiness in your heart, and you've been trying to fill it with drugs and alcohol and sex and everything else, but it just doesn't work. Uh, you've been searching, but you don't even know what you're searching for. God is the only one who can fill that vacuum. If you've never trusted His Son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior, uh, do that today. You see, Jesus took our sins. He died on the cross. He was buried and God raised him to life. And he can come into your heart and change you and forgive you. Just pray this prayer with me right now. Just say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I believe Jesus is your son and I want to trust him today as my savior. I want to invite him to come into my life and take control. If you prayed that prayer, call that number that's on the screen. Do it right now. Call that number. Someone's willing to speak with you right now. Call that number. God bless. Well, we're back with my panel. Uh, Dr. Um, Pakala gave us a lot to think about, but now we want to sort through because this birth dearth that we're having, it's, it's about values. It's not about the economy, but some people insist it is. The reason we're talking about it again, as I've mentioned to you, is because it's still in the news. Uh, so I have special guests. Jonathan was on last time we discussed this topic, uh, these reduced birth rates. Jonathan Alexandria, you know, Senior Counsel for Government Affairs at Liberty Council and Liberty Council Action here in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Star. You're in the hot seat this time because you've got girls. I got girl power this time. <laughs> we're going to talk about fertility rates and marriage rates. And the last time you guys were just like, uh, uh, uh. So I have with us Valerie Huber. Uh, she's a special representative for Global Women's Health at the Department of Health and Human Services, Global Affairs Office for the Trump administration. You've left there, though, now, because Trump administration has transitioned out. Uh, but the knowledge is still there. So thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm looking really forward to some of the things that you have to say, because we were already discussing a few things. And we've met years ago. Yeah. Yeah, so you've been in pro-life and doing wonderful work and abstinence and other areas. So thank you. We're, I'm looking forward to hearing you. And Veronique is new. Uh, de de Rougie. Yeah. Where is that? What That's, is the heritage of this? De Rougie. Oh, I'm French. French. Oh, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Veronique, I should have known that. And your senior fellow, uh, the McCarris. Mercatus. Mercatus Center at George Mason University, your syndicated columnist. Yeah. We talked about yeah. that. We're both with creators. Yeah. So we have that in common. And I think our paths have crossed before. Yes, at Cato. Oh, at the Cato Institute. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're That's where close I started. with them on social security yes. reform. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I worked there for three years 
My first day was September 11th, 2001. Oh, oh my. Wow. <laughs> well, that was I remember, interesting. They I remember yeah, that. Day. You'll never forget that. And yeah. hopefully you didn't get, forget some of the positions. And I hope that you took them with you to the no. Mercatus yes. uh, Center because we're in trouble. I mean, we're looking at falling birth rates. We're looking at falling marriage rates. We're looking at a fallen culture. But yet it seems that everybody thinks the answer is big government. Romney thinks it's big government. Marco Rubio has a plan out of government. Uh, Biden administration, boy, that's on steroids. Senator so, Hawley. Oh, Senator Hawley. What should we be really thinking about when it comes to the role of government in family life? Well, actually, if we want to be thinking about the role of government, we should be actually thinking about all the things where the government should step out of our, actually our lives, um, not just talk about one area, and that's maybe more at the at the um, at the state level. But President Biden, unfortunately, wants to take this battle to the federal level. Is childcare right. and the cost of childcare? I mean, there's studies after studies after studies that shows that uh, rules through occupational licensing requirement and mandate, even parking mandates, um, having having uh, childcare workers have have. Diplomas to watch uh, diplomas. too much babies you can only watch is a few actually increased significantly yeah. um, the cost of healthcare uh, of, of childcare child right. without really having the kind of impact that you want on safety. Right. I mean, it's just like I mean, it's not as if the, it was it was terribly like babies were dying left and right no. in the hands of child care workers. Right. Um, so so there's so many things that the government can do. And well, unfortunately, do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it started, you know, it started with conservative senators started to say, yes, there is a role for government in this. And now, of course, the Biden administration wants to do things like on steroids, like everything else. Well, that's what makes it a little harder than to talk about reducing the size and scope of government. And you're bringing up a really interesting point, Veronique, that child care makes it makes it more difficult if you have excessive regulation there for parents to say, well, I want to work as well. Um, but I want to get to at least a little bit deeper, Valerie, because the way that the, it's narrated, why we're now seeing the, both the, now the Census Bureau has pointed it out, that's why we did a show earlier, the Center for Disease Control saying, hey guys, we're falling in numbers of how many are produ reproducing ourselves. Um, but there's little discussion about what women are deciding to do now. There's little discussions about abortion. There's little discussion about removing government, as Veronique has pointed out, and having a candid conversation about our culture and biblical values. Could you speak into that for us? Yeah, well, you just unpacked a, a lot of things that really are impacting, I think, this conversation and decisions. Uh, I spent half of my time on the domestic side when I was at HHS under the Trump administration. And HHS is? The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. <laughs> Oops, I just did it, didn't I? I said not speaking in alphabet like <laughs> Alphabet soup here in Washington, D.C. But go ahead, we do it all the time. So now you guys know HHS is the Health and Human Services Department, which has a massive budget. They do so many things over there. And we have Office of Population Control over there. You got offices coming out every which way over there. They do Medicaid. Okay, anyway, whatever. Yeah. Well, go ahead, baby. You were there. So. <laughs> and half of it on the international side. But to your point, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has a budget that if it were a country, I think it would be the seventh largest country in the world. Wow. That tells you how much we are involved in family because half of uh, HHS, Health and Human Services, is devoted to health care and half of it is devoted to human services, and the largest percentage of human services is related to the family. Okay, so tell us a little bit about why that is, number one, and then what we should be thinking <coughs> about their role in these numbers that we're seeing diminish. Yeah. Some people are saying that government has to do more. Well, yeah. it sounds like being seventh largest in one department, um, government's doing enough, or maybe even part of the damage. Well, I don't want to diminish that there are certain programs that are good for stopgap emergency um, purposes, but let me talk about just one program that I think really makes our point today. If you look at our the demography uh, around the world, we're seeing this, that many countries are below replacement rate, and we are. But that has been the case since the 70s. 
Oh, since Roe v. Wade. Hmm. Since the 70s. We, and actually, where we are right now, mm -hmm. we almost replicated that in the late 70s, early 80s. So let's look at a program that was begun by the government right in the midst of our concern about overpopulation here in the United States, which was the Title X Family Planning Program. It was implemented specifically so that low-income families could have easy access to contraception and family planning. Now, Congress made it very clear that it was not to be used where abortion is as a method of family planning. But organizations like Planned Parenthood have had unmitigated access to those funds for the, same, the full 50 years. And right now, we're seeing family taking, being taken out of family planning, just as it was for 46 of those 40, 50, those 50 years. years. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're seeing parents removed from children in conversations about life-changing decisions. Well, I'm I just wondering if, 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 if the problem is that they're in that business anyway. Jonathan, I'm just wondering if the government should even be doing this, because what did they expect? If you were sending out messages is that we have a role in you fa planning your family, how could you not expect them to bring in contraceptives and, and abortion? And especially when you're talking about low income, this sounds a whole lot like Margaret Sanger's mission. Yeah, absolutely, government interjecting themselves in the, in the natural process of a family and intergenerational living. You have this idea where you know parents are paying government to raise their kids. You know, Children are then attached to government all the way through college, and then they pay into a social security system that they expect to then take care of their parents for them. And all you see is an interruption of the natural uh, parent-to-children relationship, grandparent-to-children relationship, with government spreading its tentacles within that system. And you see it in the social security uh, instance, and of course people will look at the low fertility rates and say, well, we're not going to be able to sustain Social Security for the next you know, 20 or 40 years. It'll eventually run out. But that's government interjecting itself in what should have otherwise been a natural intergenerational relationship between parents and children, mm -hmm. government spreading their tentacles there. And you, know, you mentioned Roe v. Wade. Uh, even right before that, Griswold v. Connecticut. This is 1965, where this law said you were allowed to have contraception. We've never since that point reached the levels of uh, those 3.0 fertility rate levels wow. since that ruling. And so wow. it is a cultural issue. If it's coming down on high, this rule of law saying that you can decouple uh, sexuality from uh, procreation, that's no longer a priority. You can yeah. you know, have a sexual revolution and not birth children, uh, then of course the culture 20, 40 years down the road is going to reflect this idea that children are no longer important. Important, and the, and the numbers are showing that. I know you have a thought there. Yeah. I wanted to hear that, but I also want you to then segue into Social Security because yes. I'm kind of glad it's collapsing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, this this is really interesting. As I was listening to you, I was actually thinking, this is a really great example about government intervention distorts markets, right. any markets. That's right. It but it also distorts civil society and institutions like the family, right? right? And back then, the obsession was like overpopulation. Ha as it happened, it was totally wrong, and it would have been wrong, you know, even without government intervention. And now it's the reverse. And you can I can guarantee you that if the government is as heavy-handed as it wants to be, and some call it on the right and on the, le and on the left to be, mm -hmm. it's going to create massive distortions yet again mm -hmm. for a problem that actually may find really, they, they may be actually very, I mean, in fact, I believe they'd be really good private institution exactly and solution right. that would emerge. And individual solutions. Absolutely. Like, for instance, as, as Jonathan's pointed out, that children take care of their parents as they yeah. age, that we have a, a retirement system that's based in yeah. markets. You're absolutely yeah. right, that there is a distortion. So what do we do? Because, um, uh, uh, Valerie, a whole lot of time and attention has been inside trying to fix it. Uh, you pointed out to me earlier that one of the challenges Congress keeps allowing for these things. So I want you to hold that thought because I've got to get out of here uh, to uh, get to an interview. Um, I, every time we talk about these issues, I always just need to talk to a pastor. So I'm going to talk to a pastor in a little bit, and then I'm going to come back to this question of the role of government. Veronique is right. You have 
both sides thinking that there's a role of government in places, as Jonathan said, it doesn't belong. So after this message, I will be back with Pastor, and then I'm bringing back my panel, and we're going to get on the solution side of these big, big topics. Yes, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. I need a pastor. Whenever we're talking about family, religion, marriage, we have to hear what God says about these things because the left will make sure government says a lot about these things and they'll expand government and now the right does it too. They just think there's a role of government in family, in religion, in marriage. So mm -hmm. I have Reverend Tim Latif. Glad to be here. I'm glad you're here too. He runs our clergy center here at the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, also pastor mm -hmm. with Christ Church. Christ Chapel. Yeah. Christ Chapel. In Northern Virginia. Um, in Northern Virginia and um, and always with pastors. Yeah. I mean, my goodness, you're umbrella in about 500 clergy and on a regular discussion with about 10% mm -hmm. of them yeah. about these issues. Um, marriage has collapsed. Yeah. Community has collapsed. Culture has collapsed. Our panel, we're looking for um, what role government's in. But mm -hmm. let's talk about God's role. Sure. Because one of the things that our um, special guest interview said is where she's in her research looking at why people are having children, she sees that if religion is involved in their life, they're having the children. The right. seculars are saying, nope, we don't want that. Yeah. And now we have such a secularized society, women, mm -hmm. that that's why those numbers are down to 17%. So yeah, yeah. yeah, I think this is important to have children and marriage mm -hmm. in my life. So mm -hmm. what, what are you thinking about on this? Well, uh, number one, it, it starts from Genesis, you know, that man shouldn't be alone. Mm -hmm. uh, God says it from the beginning. And then when he brings Eve in, what's Adam's response? He's like, finally, I'm excited. I need this. Wow. Um, we look in the New Testament and Ephesians. When you talk about marriage, you talk about love, you talk about respect, you talk about these foundational pieces that it's all about what God has created. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about our National Policy Summit, which obviously I, I usually plug that when we talk. <laughs> but uh, Pat Fagan, Dr. Coming Fagan, who in, in September, in, in September <laughs> Dr. Fagan, who speaks to us, talks about the, the data is there. The statistics are there that when you are married, when you have this family structure, that the children produce better academically, socially, mentally. Yeah. So the information is there. I think what's really important is that we need to highlight marriages that are succeeding, mm -hmm. that are doing well. And so that this next generation can see that this isn't a negative thing that's going to impact your life, actually is going to impact your life positively. So you're thinking instead of this new emphasis from uh, some of the senators, even right and left, mm -hmm. that are saying, well, let's just pour more government money out. Right. We've tried that for 60 years. Right. We have an entire welfare state. We've looked into other countries to see what they do, and they're having the same challenges. Out of wedlock, birth rates rise whenever we feel like it. Abortion rates rise whenever we feel like it. Because what it sounds like you're saying is, wait, these are cultural questions. Correct. And yeah. if we put up enough models of people that are successful in those marriages, just that maybe uh, we might see the, a drive toward that go up. Yeah. So my question to you would be, um, do you think that because that generation, the, the, the children of the baby boomers, yeah. had such busted up lives yeah. that that's why they're saying, I don't want that. I didn't have yeah. a dad in my house. I don't need to think about a dad in my children's life. Or um, I, my, I saw a bad marriage, so right. I don't want marriage. Yeah, well, I, I think it's a combination of that. The, the issue is that, like we do in many things in our lives, we highlight the negative instead of the positive. Let me give you a story. Uh, some years ago, my wife and I, 
we had youth come to our home. Mm -hmm. uh, about 25 middle school, high school students when we were youth pastoring came to our home just to, to have a good time. And so we had everything set up. We had the video game system set up. We had the pizza set up. We had the wings set up. <laughs> and we look over and my wife and I are like, why are they sitting around our coffee table in the living room? They found our wedding album oh, and they wow. sat there for 30, 40 minutes looking through the wedding, wedding album, then asking, how did you know that this was the right person? What is marriage like? Mm -hmm. Oh man, I really want to get married. And instead of playing video games, we talked about marriage. Mm -hmm. And so there was something inside of them that saw they really wanted that. Mm -hmm. There was something innately in these young people that mm -hmm. said marriage is a good thing. Well, my wife and I, now we're living that out, mm -hmm. eight years of marriage. Mm -hmm. They're saying, oh man, these are goals. They're, they're hashtagging it and putting it all over mm -hmm. social media that we want that. And, yeah. and my wife and our parents have been married over 30 years. And so we see that. Yeah. A lot of times we talk about the negative aspects of marriage. We don't talk about the positive. We don't talk about the stories, even within the millennial generations that are working. So if more people express, well, I've been married 45 years, mm -hmm. I've been married, and we saw that and we, and we reminded people that this is a good thing, you think yeah. that that might encourage the youth. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about, though, this economic side of it, because some are mm -hmm. saying, well, I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. Then you hear, well, I can't find the right one. Right. We're speaking to that, because sure. I believe what you said. In the very beginning, God said it's not good for mm -hmm. man to be mm -hmm. alone. And if we didn't learn anything out of COVID, COVID, we should know. Yeah. It's not good for man to be alone. Yeah. And woman. Both. Sure, sure. Uh, one. I mean, when yeah. he said man, he, he meant both. both. Uh, but these days you have to say it, I mm -hmm. suppose. But um, because it, it's just not good. And so yeah. when people come up with these excuses, well, I don't think I can afford it. Well, I want to finish my college. Well, mm -hmm. I can't find mm -hmm. the right one. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Well, I think it goes back to the structures of what we even stand for here at Cure. I mean, think about what happened with our billboard initiative and how we talked about these positive aspects of, of marriage, of mm -hmm. graduating, of finding yeah, a job, and then we're hit. Married, we and then we're hit, right? Yeah, but did. here's the deal. <laughs> if <laughs> both parties are doing that, when you come together, then economically you will be strong because right. there's a foundation right. and there's function to it. Right, and right, so even right. when I talk about the example of well, my yeah, two one, are yeah, better than yeah. one, but they did hit our billboards and yeah. it forced them down. So people right. can't see that message to mm -hmm. say, get married. Yeah. But you think if we keep saying it anyway, keep well, not only saying it, mm -hmm. but living it out. You know, right. when my, my wife and I, we had our first child who's two years old now. We came home and home. my parents were at our home after we came from the hospital and my wife's parents were at our home. They were praying in the living room right. and then they were fixing foods that would help my wife kind of restore her body and all these different aspects. And I said to myself, this works. This works. God's way works. That's There's right. a system that works. And when you get out of line, then you have the economic challenges. Then you have these other challenges because you're trying to do it your own way. Okay. And I'll say this last piece. My, my dad turned 75 a couple years ago wow. and we had a celebration to celebrate his life. And I was MC in the event and I was talking about the importance of my dad and our relationship together. Well, all of a sudden, a young man came up to me who was recently married and he said to me, Tim, I didn't have a great relationship with my dad, but I want what you all had. Wow. And I told him, I said, well, you can have it. You, you can change it, it in one generation. Change it right now, now he's been married five years, has wow. two kids, another one on the way. Wow. Another young man was there. He was sitting in the audience. Great young man about early 20s. He all of a sudden I looked in the audience and saw that he was no longer there when I was speaking. Uh -huh. I found out later that he did not have a great relationship with his dad, went to the parking lot, called his dad and said, I was angry at you, but I want to restore our relationship. His dad drove all the way to that parking lot, met with him and they're reconciling their relationship. A part of this is telling the truth. A part of this is realizing that it does work. And some of these fears don't add up to what the data actually may say, but it doesn't add up to what God says. And if you do it his way, it does work. I love it. Faith. Yeah. The substance of things hoped for. Yeah. The evidence of things that we don't see. So even Certainly. if they don't see it in their life, you can have faith for it. Yeah. And you've so much encouraged me, Tim, because the alternative is what government has been doing. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we're seeing so much despair, especially in our most distressed and weakest communities, is because government got yeah. in and it busted up family life. That's right. It is so underappreciated that when you think about even the black community, yeah. that until they started that welfare state, that 60s social engineering, that 78% of husbands were yeah. in their homes That's right. with their wives yeah. raising those children. That's right. And it can work again, yeah. huh? Yeah, and it brings <laughs> something out of you. Yeah, I was just reading an article of a, a an NBA player 
who says new new Joel and, and this basketball player they called him a new Joel because he's mm -hmm. a father now wow. and he says in this article he talks about how I want my son to see the best in me because I saw the best in my father wow. and now his teammates are saying we see a different him because wow. he has his son now wow. so there's something, there's there, something there that can come out of you yeah. if you depend on God yeah. and not completely on government well, we're going to talk a little bit with my panel. Thank you, Reverend, yeah. because um, you know we're going to get on the solution side of it. And let's think about ways that we might be able to get away from what government has done, yeah. whether it's in education policy, social security policy, those types of areas, some of the things that are even being done inside of government when, when good, godly people are in there trying That's to right. move some things around. But we can never get away from what you just said. Yeah. We cannot get away from the fact that God just, he built marriage, he That's built right. community, he built that desire within all of us to say, I don't want to be alone. We don't That's want to right. be alone and away from him. We don't want to be alone and away from those he has created. So Amen. thank you for that thank reminder. You. I'll be right back with my panel. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. 2021, and the pandemic is still here. People are still afraid, scared. Some states open, some states close, then they open. It's just crazy. But I can tell you that the only hope that we have is God. God made us and created us, and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to take our sins. And Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried for our sins, and God raised him to life. And he'll come into your heart, and he'll change you, and he'll give you a new life and a new beginning. But you've got to invite him. If you've never invited Christ into your heart, do it right now. Just pray this prayer with me. Just say, Dear God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I want to turn from my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, and I want to trust him as my Savior, and I want to follow him as my Lord, and I pray that in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, call that number right now that's on the screen. Call it. God bless. always gives us something to think about in the scripture when it's these big topics because this is a very big topic we have marriage family role of religion and um a free society or desire to be a free society and yet we have so much government in so many places that's why i'm so glad my guests are here veronique de rigri de rigi. De rigi and Valerie Huber and Jonathan Alexander. Um, uh, Veronique is from George Mason University. She's at the Emeritus Center there. She's a senior fellow and a syndicated columnist. Uh, Valerie, who's in the hot seat because I want to ask you the question right now, special representative for global women's health at the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, at least was in the Trump administration, has now brought her ideas to new places. And then Jonathan is our legal voice. I need a legal voice because I don't like big government. And I think that if we're going to reduce the size and scope of government, we always have to have a lawyer in the house so he can get us through the lawsuits. <laughs> so, so, so Valerie, before before um, we were in the panel uh, and we took a break just to find out, well, what does God say about these things? We were discussing this role of government because we've had the administration. Veronique has brought up an interesting point that it's both the left and the right that keep increasing these budgets and keep saying that the government should be in places that we know it's not. Tell us a little bit of insight. How, what do you do when you know that they're in places they shouldn't be, but you can't just close the department down. Tell us some of the things that you were doing inside, and you were mm -hmm. telling me that uh, when you passed your baton, you passed it to someone in Brazil who now has a wonderful Christian leader. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about that so they can be on the hopeful, <laughs> yes, there's a solution side. Well, a lot of the policies that the Trump administration put in place over the last four years are easily erased with the next administration, but one of them cannot be, and that is an international coalition of countries that the U.S. took the lead on putting together um, surrounding several pillars. One is improving the health of women around the world. Unfortunately, too many women are dying from totally preventable causes in the developing world. The second is preserving life throughout all um, stages of development and asserting that there is no international right to abortion. Which is something the Biden administration thinks there is. The, exactly. Most, but he can't exactly. this particular coalition. Exactly. And okay. the, the third is protecting the family as foundational to any healthy society as the premier um, institution. And then fourth is preserving the sovereign right of countries to legislate on these. Well, 
There were 35 countries in this coalition representing every single um, region of the world, more than 1.6 billion people who said, not only we agree with these principles, but we are going to work together to preserve them. Wow, that, that's good news, I think. It is. Because we're looking at, um, Jonathan, a culture um, a phenomenon all around yeah. the world that even when you mention the word family, uh, what does that even mean exactly. anymore? In, tr in tradition, you think of it as husband married to mother children, but that's not what we're seeing as predominant in our culture, in cultures all across the country. So, the, I mean, across the world. So you got right. just little ones grasping. So this is good news. But what can we be thinking about doing to to expand that so that those countries don't feel alone. Uh, we had some situations where little African countries right. were saying, we don't want the LGBTQ stuff here, and yet they, well, then you're gonna lose all your money. Right. And how do we fix this? Yeah, I mean, government, one of the, the sad things that America does is export some of the, the worst ideas to countries that don't want it, and they'll attach our uh, generosity and our funds uh, to promoting some of the worst aspects uh, that have sadly infiltrated our culture. Uh, one thing that America can do uh, is, well, first we do have to address what the issue is, where the majority of kids are being raised either by single parents, by a parent who's married to someone that's not their natural parent, or, or being raised by two folks that, that aren't their parent at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we do have to identify what the problem is, but it can never, the solution can never be found in government. It always has to be a cultural thing uh, that sort of addresses this and fixes this. So from an early age, have to encourage individuals to want to pursue family life. Right now, unfortunately, we have a culture, it's necessary, but we have a culture that pushes contentment and fulfillment uh, being based on your bottom line, being based on how much you earn or how much you achieve. It's crazy. You and, look at those numbers, it's crazy. I mean, it's, okay, the guys I can see, they don't want to be roped in, uh -uh, kind of, but when you see women saying at 17% numbers that, you know, I could be fulfilled with family life, I, I just, something has broken down in culture. And especially then when you have everybody opinion, well, no, it should have always been that way. Women have always felt that way, but they were trapped in the idea of getting married. That's Western culture, that's systemic in its nature. And, and why that's not true is because later on, they'll show those same women want uh, that later on in life after their highest earning uh, age, uh, they want to be able to then have the children. And, and at the same time, you'll have, you know, you'll have the, <laughs> the entire fertility industry that is yeah. trying to address, uh, you know, women still wanting to have children past the their natural oh, age of right. childbearing. Mm -hmm. um, and another industry that comes and tries to address a problem that could have been addressed if there was more of a cultural incentive mm -hmm. uh, for individuals to prioritize mm -hmm. family life. Uh, I'll say quickly, I, mm -hmm. I, I never want to pit a woman's career mm -hmm. against her uh, childbearing. I think you know the calling that God has placed on both men and women to be image bearers in all aspects of society can be maintained. Maintain. That balance can be there, but at the same time, there has to be an emphasis on raising those children and, and being family-centric mm -hmm. at the same time. Or at least allowing for the option, letting both, both voices be heard, and then getting government out of the way that is forcing people to make choices that maybe they might not make. And so, Veronique, I want to ask you about two areas. One, what we're doing with government control and education. And then two, I want to revisit that Social Security question, because I believe if we peel back government in both of those areas, people will get more information. They will not be <laughs> pigeoned down this ideological hole of government it's the answer so you can live any kind of life patterns that you want. I'm, I'm kind of hoping that the role of government in education is going to be actually really challenged in people's mind because of this pandemic. Yeah. When you see that, I mean, my kids are still barely going to school mm -hmm. and they're getting, you know, I think they're getting probably 40% of the instruction that they used to get. Oh and it's just really insane. There's all these, you know, um, hygiene theater going on. And, and I think a lot of parents in Arlington County in Virginia, where I live, 2,000 parents have already taken their kids out of public school, them. which is 7%. Seven wow. percent of the enrollment of the, of the in Ooh, in, in nice Arlington. That continues. It's a it's a yeah it's it's good. So I mean I th it, it's absolutely clear, and you write beautifully about this about the importance of school choice. Yes. Uh, I mean, parents uh, very often, based on their situation, are in it are trapped in schools that are just just terribly bad. They are captive. They can't. Uh, they they can't take. They can't have the choice that uh, richer parents have, that's right, that's right. and or parents in in higher income parents who are right, in right. 
you know, Arlington County types that have actually decent, in general, public schools. Um, and so school choice, more, more choice for parents would actually kind of, I think if, if people realize that their kids had a real future, because education is really, I mean, is really a way out mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of a lot of, of problems mm -hmm. is essential. On the social security front, I mean, I just think it is such a 1930s <laughs> program. <laughs> it was starting because the government wanted to interfere, to intervene in, in an issue which was real, but again, I don't think it was the role of government, which is like when you couldn't work and when you were old, you were poor because the capital markets hadn't actually evolved and, 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 and exploded. And, and it was true that seniors were really overrepresented in a lower income quintile. This is not true anymore. That's right. Seniors are actually overrepresented in the top income quintile and younger Americans aren't. And so what you have is a system that is profoundly unfair. Not only it's a bad investment, but you have basically the relatively poor and young in our society making massive wealth transfer mm -hmm. to seniors who are relatively who are old <laughs> and, and, and relatively rich. Yeah. And, and it's just totally unfair. We need yeah. to kind of get rid of all yeah. systems that are based on age right. and focus on needs. It yeah. doesn't make any sense anymore. Yeah. Well, I think that that's what some are saying they're doing even but with the hand of government, which I don't agree with at all. So when we talk about need, uh, real, real quick, Valerie, let's talk about family. Isn't that where when husbands married to mother children, we see those needs met? You know, I was just thinking that government programs are really pressing for personal autonomy above family. Mm -hmm. And there really is a cultural reckoning. Way. Yeah, but mm -hmm. there is a there is a cultural reckoning mm -hmm. because as that becomes a cultural belief, which I think we're seeing that exactly. move yeah. toward yeah. that, I think so it's going to be very chilling for the, the future of our nation and the future of our, our uh, families. Let me give one, just one example. Um, we were negotiating to try to have the family inserted in an international resolution, and one country said it was a red line for us to include the family wow. because it compromised the individual autonomy of the person. And if we see that belief system to continue to grow, yeah. our families are going to be in serious trouble. Terrible but Vera, trouble. But Veronique brought up something that um, could give us a little bit of hope, and that is on the parent and education part of this, they're starting to recognize that, uh-uh, government, you failed me. You failed my kids. You can't even figure out how to open the schools. But they're also seeing some other things, like critical race theory. Uh, is there hope to get rid of all that system, as well as, as we're peeling back and revisiting whether Social Security was a good idea, John? Yeah, I think this is a perfect time for it. Parents are realizing that you know, you know, when you pay your taxes, out of every dollar that you pay, 40 cents is going towards, you know, a the educational complex that is not uh, teaching your children the right way or they're coming home with theories and ideas that aren't, you know, bibl certainly not biblically centric, not familial centric. Uh, certainly this is a time for parents to start paying attention to the alternatives in education. Yeah, I think that, yeah, good topic because you brought up um, COVID and I think that that actually may be a blessing, a silver lining in that, that people are reassessing and thinking about their lives. I mean, we're looking at higher suicide rates. We're looking at people are, readjusting, I hope that life alone is not good. Now, the numbers that we're looking at from the Census Bureau to, or the Center for Disease Control are from the year prior. I'm wondering as we start seeing what happens as a result of late 2020, early 2021, if we're going to now see that baby boom so I can get my little $5 that I had on the table that we would have a baby <laughs> boom and a marriage boom. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about the, the, I really don't know about the baby boom, but one of the things that we're are likely to see, and it shows that actually the government and doesn't need to 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 get into paid leave at the federal level oh, yeah, the and, and all that stuff yeah um, because what's happening is that 
um, I think companies first who were providing a tremendous amount of paid leave, 65% of workers already have access to a form of paid leave. And the BLS data is only, it's not that it's a wrong number, but it only looks at paid leave for the, the, the program that are like in isolation, that's called paid leave, it's not, they're not sick leave, they're not. And so so we're, what we're finding is that basically uh, companies are starting to allow much more flexibility. There's going to be a lot more of tele, teleworking and things like this, which allows balance and migration outside of big cities, yeah. which is not going to be permanent and, and total, I mean, is going to be able to afford more, right. uh, more family balanced life. That's right. That's and, right. and so so I you're think thinking, so you're hopeful that women will start to, um, for even secular reasons, choose marriage and family that we might not need uh, to revisit culture to say, hey, guys, you're way far from biblical truth. So I, I, I think that there's actually all this time that people have spent together, mm -hmm. I think it actually refocused um, people in their lives in a way that was really a blessing. Well, I think that's a good last part of our panel. I'll be back with some final thoughts. Thank you all for being with me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a quick history lesson. Just two centuries ago, 94% of the people in the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, it's eight and a half percent. In a century, our life expectancies more than doubled. How did we come so far so fast? The freedom to create, to start a business, to keep what you earn. Don't let the socialists and radical left cost us our progress, our freedom, and our well being. It's time we fight for America and vote for America. It's time for a cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, DC, Cure works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. Cure's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo-Christian perspective. Cure, join with us. There has never been a better time to help black communities. some deep conversation about what we can do to get back on track in our society. Emphasizing the good of having children and getting married and starting a family as God planned it. And we've discovered that government cannot solve these problems, no matter how much money they throw at the problem, no matter how much they do through, or ideas they keep bringing here to Washington, D.C. and trying to test them out on people, in particular poor people. Becoming a socialized country and letting government do our family planning is not the solution. I've been working my entire career to get people off of welfare. So how do we turn things around? Well, one thing we can do for starters is more parental choice and education so parents can take their children out of these failing government schools and send them to Christian schools where they can learn the biblical truths and values that sustain life. How about that? As we learn from Dr. Catherine and from Pastor Tim, that it is these values of faith and family passed along to the next generation. That's what it takes to make a difference and cause young people to notice and say, I want that in my life. Today's society demeans the family. It looks down on those who have many children instead of pointing to the good, including the economic good of the family unit. It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for woman to be alone. We know that. Many of us learned it through COVID. This is not good what we've done. Family is the unit that keeps our society together, intact, helping each other, taking care of children, taking care of your parents and grandparents when they're older and grandparents helping the grandchildren learn how to live. This is not about relying on government. Government can't do this for us. We must do this for ourselves and for God's kingdom. I'm Star Parker. See you again next week on Cure America.